Hello everybody and welcome to Provis Gaming. Cradle of Civilization, the latest expansion for Europa Universalis 4, has officially been released and you know what that means. It is time for us to start up a new single player campaign and I am quite excited about this one. I hope that you guys are too. Now in this particular video, I'm going to have to go over some of the changes that were done in this expansion. I'm going to try to make it relatively quick, kind of a bullet points list. I don't want to spend too much time in it. I'd rather just jump straight into the game. But some of these, uh, some of the features, some of the changes are so obvious, we kind of have to address it before I even pick my nation. So let's start with some of the most obvious stuff. The Timurids have been completely reworked. They are not a massive sprawling empire at the beginning of the game. Instead, their uh, nation has been split up into a core empire and then several different vassals to represent the Timurid princes. Once the current great sultan dies, Shah Rukh, then there will be some scripted events to give a ton of liberty desire uh, to these different princes and they will all kind of fight a massive civil war vying for control of the Timurid empire. So they're kind of taking this, the Timurids used to at the very beginning of the game have a lot of separatism issues. They're kind of reworking that a little bit and giving you the option to play as one of the different Timurid princes if you want to. Pretty darn interesting. I really considered playing them, but I think the first 50 years of the game would be mostly just dealing with a lot of rebellions. And then after that, we kind of would snowball out of control and it wouldn't be that fun. The Mamluks have seen some big changes. I'm not quite as familiar with them, but I know they get a lot of unique government interactions. They are the Mamluk government type, so now there's something unique. It has some interactions with the uh, Circassian slave heritage and stuff like that. Not too familiar with them, but should be kind of fun interest anyway. Persia has been revamped. So now, the, uh, even though Persia doesn't exist at the beginning of the game, there is a unique government type, the feudal theocracy, that Persia will receive. If you wanted to see that at the very beginning of the game, we could play as Artabil. Uh, which, if we look here, there we go. Feudal Theocracy is their starting government type, and they do that because Ardabil is kind of the birthplace of what will later become a revamped Persia. So, kind of exciting. You could play with that. I'm looking forward to seeing what that does later in the game. Lots of special interactions for them. And then lastly, we can look at these two guys. I'm going I'm to mispronounce this, and it's going to happen this way for the entire series, and I apologize in advance. Ak Koyunlu and Kara Koyunlu is the best I'm able to do. The White Sheep Federation and the Black Sheep Federation, respectively. They've been completely reworked as well. They used to be hordes, like the Great Horde, like Nogai, Uzbek, and so on. Now, they are tribal federations, which we can see here. There we go, special sultanate. Um, how that's going to change up the politics of the game, not too sure yet, but I'm looking forward to finding out. Um, and on top of all of this, we have seen the Muslim faith get completely revamped, which is going to change which nation we start as. If we were to look at, let's say, Ak Koyunlu, who I think I will be playing in this particular series, they start off as Sunni, but interestingly enough, Paradox does not tell you which school of uh, Muslim law they will be playing as. That's interesting. Kind of unfortunate. I'd like to see Paradox add that in the future if we can. We will be playing as Ak Koyunlu in this particular game. I'll probably call them Ak or Aq in the future so I don't keep mispronouncing it. But uh, they have some pretty darn strong national ideas. They are a tribal federation at the beginning of the game with their own special uh, interactions that can later reform into an Ikta government, which we can see... There we go. Okay, Ikta government type, which is a special Islamic monarchy type, I think. They have their own taxation mechanics, which will be really interesting. And then Ak Koyunlu can form Persia later, which means we'll also get to look at the Persian theocracy. So three different special government types over the course of this series, which is really the best I can do as far as experiencing new content. As far as their national ideas, <clears throat> excuse me, my throat. Let's take a look at what they have to start off. For our special traditions, we have 10% morale of armies and 20% cavalry combat ability. Very strong. We're going to want to have a lot of cavalry in the beginning of the game if we can. And that's easier as a tribal federation because we're allowed to have more cavalry to infantry ratio without getting some penalties. So that's pretty darn strong. If we can get all of our national ideas done, we also would get a land maintenance modifier minus 10%, which saves a ton of money. Pretty good. We have the White Sheep, which gives us Land Leader Shock, not bad. Unite the Clans for a Cavalry Cost Reduction, so we can have even more Cavalry. And Yearly Tribal Allegiance, which is a special currency we'll get to spend later. I will show you that in a little bit. The Turco-Iranian Bureaucracy gives us a minus 20% Core Creation Cost, which is huge. 
and will save us a ton of admin power. Very strong. Love that one. Uh, Dynastic Ap Appanages? Appanages? However you say that. Gives us an extra 25% national manpower. Very solid. Expansive Diplomacy for another Diplomat. Also quite good. Religious Pragmatism. Minus 10% uh, Stability Cost Modifier. It's okay. It'll add up over time. And then lastly, uh, I don't know how you say that. Canon Nama Ye Hassan. An extra 10% national goods produced. Not bad. Very strong national ideas. I like this a lot. Hoping that I will be able to stay as this nation for a while. Let's just go ahead and jump straight into the game. Since I've spent the last five minutes talking about some changes in the game. The different features that have been added. We will go over a lot more in the future, I'm sure. But I want to get playing. You understand. So to start us off, you may see right off the bat we have something different. A summary screen that talks a bit about the history of the co uh, country you're playing as. Um, different legacy here from Iraq to Azer Azerbaijan. Pretty cool. Some uh, explanation of the religion mechanics and what's been changed here, the government type, and the environment. Pretty interesting. I think they decided to borrow these features from CK2, but if you want a lot more background on the nation you're playing as, this is a pretty good way to start us off. I'd recommend reading it to those of you who might be interested. All right. So, one of the big changes I want to go over right off the bat. Religion. The Muslim faith is very different from how it used to be, and I'm not sure how it's going to change the way that the game is played, but I'm eager to see what happens. Starting off right here, we are Sunni. Okay, no differences there. We have some Coptic lands that we will have to convert. That will be important. But then there's this unique little icon right here. What does this mean? What is it? Well, I'm glad that you asked. Let's take a quick look. So it used to be that the Muslim faith had a piety mechanic, and you kind of went from either being very pious or very secular, one of the two. And depending on which extreme you followed, you'd get different benefits. So the more pious you were, the more missionary strength you had. The more secular you were, the lower tech costs you had. Stuff like that. That's kind of the same as it is now, sort of, except now we are switching between mysticism, which gives you missionary strength, morale of armies, and fort defense, and legalism, which gives you taxes, manpower, and tech cost. As you might imagine, I'm going to like the legalism quite a bit. I'm going to say that you gain or lose piety, but don't think of it in terms of, like, losing stability or losing prestige. Again, kind of going down the negative piety route gets you more mysticism, and that can be good depending on what you're going for. So when I say lose piety, it could actually be a good thing, not a negative. I'm just saying that to try and, you know, make sure people don't get too confused. But you'll go kind of go up and down the slider, depending. We are right now at minus 30 piety, which gives us some missionary strength. Not bad for the beginning of the game, I suppose. Uh, and different events or policies will kind of shift you up and down. Depending on whether or not you have minus 75 or positive 75, you could also enact two different uh, events. There is mysticism giving you extra manpower, and legalism giving you a reduction in corruption. But once you click this button, let's say I was at 75 piety here, positive, if I click this button, it will shift me, I think, 50 back down the negative direction. And maybe you are at a very mystic uh, play style, for example, and you want to switch toward legalism. We well, could click this, and it's a good way to zip over toward legalism while also getting some free manpower. A lot of different interactions there. It's going to be interesting to see how that all works out in the future. But as for this icon, we have different religious schools within Islam, different legal schools, which will have a big impact on the game. To start us off, we are following Hanafi. Now, this is all predetermined. You do not get to switch which religious school you are following, which is one of the reasons I think that Paradox should tell you which religious school you're following when you're picking your nation. That's just my personal opinion. What does this do? Well, for us in particular, it gives us an admin tech cost reduction of 5% for the rest of the game, which is pretty good, if and you were to ask me. But other Islamic nations will have different schools. So, for example... We can look at Kara, which follows Ismali. Now, what does that do? Good question. We could invite a scholar from a different legal school and see what benefits we would get. In the case of Ismali, yearly legitimacy plus one. Now, presumably then, Kara permanently has the, religious, uh, the legitimacy plus one, and they could try to invite somebody from my school and get the tech cost reduction and so on. So the way that this is supposed to work is you could spend 50 admin power to invite a scholar of a different legal school and you will get some sort of special ability. Development cost, merchant, aggressive expansion, so on, and it lasts for about 20 years. Pretty cool. Now, you, there are some requirements though. You have to make sure that one of the Islamic nations that follows that religious teaching 
is an ally of yours and they like you quite a bit. For example, if we wanted to get Hembali, which gives us a minus 10% aggressive expansion, we would need to make sure that, uh, well, it says Dewasir. I think it could be any nation that follows it, maybe like Najd or something, has to be allied with us or a subject of us, and they have to like us quite a bit. Now, that's going to be interesting because this is going to change up the alliances, I think, that we'll see form between the Islamic world quite a bit, especially in multiplayer. Depending on which benefit you're looking for, you're going to want to find a way to either ally or vassalize one of those little nations, which will be interesting. How is that going to change the balance of the game? I'm not too sure, but I like the benefit that we start off with with the minus 5% admin cost. All right, 10 minutes in so far. And I've mostly gone over the overview of the stuff that I think we care about a lot, but let's go over our government type before we go too far into the game. So, we are a tribal federation. I already went over some of the features of this. We will have more cavalry. Um, years of separatism reduced. The war score cost is reduced. That's pretty cool. But we also have a special government interaction here using tribal allegiance, a unique uh, currency that we will generate over time. Right now, it's going down. So, let's see, it's because our development is too low, I guess? Or is it because it's too high? I'm not sure which one it is, so we'll, we'll kind of experiment with that as we go. But we do know we get a national idea that increases it once we get up to Unite the Clans. Now, we can spend this on three different government interactions. It's very similar to the way that Russia got changed in the Third Rome. We can enlist a general, which spends 30 tribal allegiance, to get a general with 40 tradition. It's the exact same thing as the estate mechanics with, let's say, the Amirs where we could grant a generalship, and they would get influence. Same concept, but we spend tribal allegiance. We have train horsemanship, which for 10 years would give us 15% cavalry combat ability. Very solid. And then we have conscript from tribes, which starts the construction of six Muslim cavalry archers for 0% of the cost. I imagine this is sort of similar to the banner mechanics that we saw up in Manchuria, but we'll kind of see how that works later. We need to get a lot of tribal allegiance to do that, but free units, hey, that can make all the difference. You never really know. I think the way that we primarily get this is by winning battles and stuff like that. So we're going to want to make sure that we are able to humiliate our opponents, kill all their men, and that's going to make us a bit more stronger. More stronger? Wow, what did I just say? That's terrible. All right, so that's 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 Ak Akoyon Luda to start off on the game. Let's go ahead and press play, go up to speed 5, start finally playing it, since I know you guys are interested in seeing... Uh, the actual game rather than just a patch notes video. Kandar, interestingly enough, would like to be friends. Kandar, where are you? Okay, you are following the Hanafi school, just like I am. You are up here. Oh, right. So you are a two province nation up here tucked around the Ottomans. Not sure if that's an alliance we're really interested in. The Ottomans will probably kill them very soon, but we will consider it later. Uh, the Ottomans, actually, it's pretty important to note, have lost their cores, I think. Yep, they've lost their cores in all of this land up here, which means Kandar, Karaman, and so on will have a little bit more time to breathe. Pretty good for us in this particular playthrough, not so good for the Ottomans. Um, we have some neighboring nations, like who's who's this guy here? Okay, Aniza, uh, or something like that. We could try killing some independent nations, try to get some vassals. I kind of want to kill these guys. They are allied to the Mamluks, though, so I'm not going to be able to. Um, hmm, what about Trebizond? You allied... Okay, we have a lot of alliances fo uh, forming and not a lot that I can do. Not gonna be able to kill these guys too easily anymore. Hmm, gonna be important. Alright, uh, let us take a look at who rivaled us. So we have Dulkadir, who is... This guy, okay, ally of the Mamluks, not much we can do about them. Trebizond has rivaled me, okay, be a good excuse to kill them. Kara, of course, has rivaled me, we start off as rivals, I think. Uh, bitter enemies, the black sheep versus the white sheep and stuff like that. Let's go ahead and rival Trebizond back. Let's rival Kara back. And let's see who Kara hates. Kara is hated by the Mamluks. Okay, that might be important. Maybe we can get the Mamluks to ally us. If that's the case, we do not want to rival Dul Qadir, because that would create some conflicts of interest. Uh, Mamluks, who do you hate? You hate Venice and the Timurids. Okay, so I can't rival any of them. Imareti, that's these guys up here. These guys, probably worth it. Okay, we're going to rival Trebizond, Samchkich, and Kara. All seems reasonable enough. Now, who hates you? Georgia hates you. Imareti, 
myself. Maybe I can make an alliance with Georgia pretty early on in the game. That wouldn't be terrible, I think. Um, we could... I think I'm going to go ahead and try to force these guys to become a vassal of mine pretty early on. So let's go ahead and immediately start spying on them. Get a claim going. Wouldn't mind killing Trebizond and also Samanshka. Um... Turning them into vassals could be pretty strong, too. Let's start fabricating a claim against Samanchka or whatever. And let's start improving relations with the Mamluks and see if we can get ourselves a powerful alliance pretty early on. Not going to be able to convert anybody right now. Some national decisions we could achieve. Religious unity. Going to be kind of tough right now. Placate the Ottomans. Make them like me. That would be a good idea if I had to free up a uh, relationship slot. Protect our brethren in Rabha. Where is that? Rabha? Ah, against Kara. Well, that would give me a claim against Kara right off the bat, but I'm not sure that's a good idea. They are a lot stronger than we are at the beginning of the game. I'm going to go ahead and pick up the Placate Ottomans option. That'll be pretty nice. Denouncement of sect practices. This would allow me to move toward legalism and reduce unrest. Do I have a lot of unrest right now? Tiny bit. May not be a bad idea if I wanted to lose some of my mysticism. So here's the thing. You do get penalized a little bit for not choosing an extreme. If we were to go up toward legalism, I don't get any of these benefits. And in the meantime, I lose some of my mysticism benefits. So you kind of want to go to the extreme of one or the other and not be in between too much. Do I want to commit toward working toward legalism or not, though? Not sure yet. Maybe. Maybe not. How are we looking as far as money? We are currently losing a bit of money. Uh, but we are at full army maintenance. Okay. That's going to be pretty important for us, though. Army maintenance is actually a bit more important than ever before, in my personal opinion. And that is because of a new mechanic that was added in called army professionalism. Hello! Right now, it allows us to recruit our general plus 1%. I think we have a chance of just, like, getting a free general or something like that. I'm not too sure yet. But um, basically, army professionalism has to do with uh, how professional your standing army is if you're using mercs or, like, an actual long-term... Uh, standing military. And as you kind of work up the uh, army professionalism, you'll get different uh, benefits. For example, you could build supply depots. You could refill a garrison, special interactions. Regain manpower whenever you disband your troops. That's pretty good. Uh, general cost is reduced, or army drill gain modifier, stuff like that. I don't know, a lot of things that we're going to see happen with uh, army professionalism. I expect this to take a long time to fill up. But we should probably gain a lot of it over time. Uh, but what is army drilling? That's going to be kind of important. We could take a look at this real quick. Uh, let's see. Not that. Siege view. Attack natives. Force march. Scourge earth. Burn colony. Seize colony. Free fill garrison. Supply depot. Drilling. There it is. If we get a general in charge, okay, we could drill our troops. And you can see there's this little bar right here that needs to fill up. Now what this does is it takes a bit of time, reduces them down to minimum morale, and it costs you full army maintenance, but you will get the army drill mechanic, which gradually decays and increases their combat ability, I think, for time. So if we were to, for example, let's start by making our ruler and our heir into a leader. Oh my god, our... Oh, yes. Okay, our, our heir is really good. A 4-5-5 five, five at the beginning of the game, that's pretty nice. Let's go ahead and put him in charge. We can drill these guys right away. And this will immediately give us a little bit of army professionalism. And it also increases a chance for skill increase for our general. That's pretty cool. Let's click the button. So we should see that they are drilling. And their morale, I thought was going to go down to zero, but it hasn't yet. Maybe it will later. Over time, though, their army drill mechanic will start going up by 0.83 per month. Let's wait until the end of a month and see what we get. Ottomans hungry, blah, blah, blah. And the Trade League of Genoa immediately disbanded. How'd that happen? Okay, yes, their morale did go down. But now we can see that they have 1.66 army drill. What does this do? It increases their fire damage, their shock damage, and it reduces the damage they take from both. This is not combat ability, but it definitely makes them more effective in combat. So if you're able to get your army constantly drilled up to 100%, presumably we get some pretty huge combat penalty uh, advantages over our opponents, especially those that do not drill their troops. And in the meantime, because we're doing a little bit of drilling, we get some army professionalism. 
At this current threshold, it is reducing our mercenary costs and increasing the number of mercenaries available. Over time, this goes away. I think we get something different. Let's see. Uh, I'm not too sure yet. We'll see what happens as we cross into different thresholds and what the bonuses are. Maybe it makes our troops more effective, or maybe it just means we have less mercenaries available in exchange for, you know, these things. Supply depot, garrisons, so on. Not too sure yet. Going to be interesting. All right. Who wants alliances? Karaman. That's not a bad idea. Um, except that the Ottomans will probably want to kill you. And Ramazan, who is... This guy right here. So both of them want to be friends. Hmm. I kind of want to be friends with Georgia so we can kill these guys kind of early on. Um, I want to have a relationship slot taken up for the Mamluks. Right now, who do I have? Four relationship slots. We could accept both of them if we want, just to have some friends. Defensive alliances against Kara, make sure they don't kill us. It's not the worst idea in the world. Alright, to start us off, we're going to accept both of these. They'll be fine, I just hope the Ottomans don't decide to get involved too much at the beginning of the game. Boundary dispute. The lack of good maps or tools to create accurate maps would occasionally lead to overlapping claims of authority. We could press the issue against Dul Qadir, who is this guy, allied to the uh, uh, Mamluks, or we could just lose the stability. I'm going to go ahead and accept that they're not going to like me and gain a claim, but I am hopeful that we don't see them use it against us in any way, because, well, I don't want to lose the stability. Now, in the meantime, while we are uh, training our troops and drilling them up, we are vulnerable. If someone were to jump on us, we could be in big trouble. Something to consider. So at some point, we're going to want to stop drilling them if we think we're in danger and start using them against other people. We could go for some royal marriages. I guess I'll go ahead and accept that for the time being. Could choose some, adv um, some uh, advisors. Not going to do that right now. Um, but you can see here, one thing that changed with advisors is you now can see the culture and the religion of those advisors, which presumably would either change their cost or maybe it changes some events. I'm not too sure yet. That is a new feature that I'm looking to find out about. Man looks are going around influencing everyone. That's interesting. Would you be interested in an alliance? They would in fact be interested in an alliance already. Let's go ahead and pull off of this and request it before we go too far. Bam. Now we have the Mamluks defending us, which hopefully will stop Kara from doing anything too crazy and hopefully doesn't put us in the crosshairs of the Ottomans too early on. Yeah, they're not going to be happy about that. I am allied to a rival, but let's go ahead and start improving relations with the Ottomans while we build up a spy network, see what we can do. Now I know in a couple of months I'm going to have all I need to uh, go for a claim. So, interesting. You did... Yes, they did decide to go for a partnership over Lithuania. That's fine. Anyway, um, so yeah, in a couple of months, I want to stop drilling my army. And instead, we'll go ahead and start uh, letting the morale tick back up so we can go ahead and declare a war. That's the idea, anyway. The surrender of Maine. Okay, so France gives up some land to England. That's fine. Mamluks are still influencing people. That's an interesting choice. Let's stop drilling our troops and start getting our morale back. So right now, we were able to get ourselves up to 9 army drill, which gives us a 0.9% difference. So presumably, this could go all the way up to 10% by the time you fully drill an army. Now, that costs us a lot of money, right? You can't reduce your army maintenance and drill them. It treats them as if they're full maintenance regardless, okay? So that actually may make money more important than ever before in the game, which is interesting. Now... We could take advantage of some of the new mechanics with uh, merchants in order to try and improve our money and give us some extra actions. So, for example, I think I'll go ahead and send a guy to... Where's our current guy? Where's my current merchant? We have one up here in Crimea. Well, that's interesting. I'm not sure we need that, but we'll look at that in a second. Uh, let us probably transfer some trade power from Persia while we can and take a look at Crimea since we already have a merchant here. These are some new actions you can take with your merchants. So our current trading policy is to maximize profit, which increases the trade power in a node by 5%. Not too bad. We could instead, though, go for hostile trading, which increases the spy network construction in the trade node itself, which means if we switch to this, we can build up claims against Trebizond, and uh, Samtesh <laughs> a little bit faster, if we wanted to. Kind of cool. 
If we had 50% or more trade power in Crimea with a merchant, we could do an uh, inland route, which allows us to increase our siege ability and artillery bonus in the trade region. Pretty interesting. We could also establish communities, which improves relations with members who have land in the Crimea trade node. That's also pretty cool. And then finally, if we had 50% or more trade power, we could go for Propagate Religion, which I'm not sure how it works yet, though I suspect it's sort of similar to the Reformation stuff you'll see for Christianity. Basically, over time, kind of randomly, you might start seeing um, some of the, of the provinces in this trade node flipping to your religion. This only seems to work for the Muslims, so that's pretty potent. But hey, if it means that we're able to uh, change religion for our provinces without using missionaries, that's pretty darn cool. Now, I don't think that we necessarily want anyone in Crimea. I'm going to go ahead and recall you. For now, anyway. I mean, we could trade our, change our trade policy to get more spy network, but I'm not going to worry about that right now. Let's see if we can just collect a little bit more here in uh, Aleppo. Now, here we could do the same sort of thing. Maximize profit, hostile trading, and so on. Uh, communities doesn't do me a lot of good right now. If I had 50%, though, you can imagine... Getting that extra siege ability and stuff like that would make it easier for me to win wars in the Aleppo trade node, which we're interested in doing. So that's kind of cool. A lot of new stuff in this expansion. A lot of new stuff. And it looks like our enemies are already claiming stuff against me. Hmm. Would prefer that you do not do that, but thank you. All right. We can get ourselves a claim against these guys. Uh, they are still allied to only one. They are trying to make the Mamluks like them. That's fine. Let's go ahead and fabricate our claim. We are about at our full uh, morale. So, I'm going to go ahead and declare a war immediately, I think. Trade guilds and fraternities. I think this is a new event. Guilds and fraternities are a constant factor in the public life of the Sultanate in many ways. These are small communities within the community. With their own rules, customs, and even laws. Uh, own orthodox adaption of Sharia law and so on. And this could actually be normal and I'm just not familiar since I don't usually play a Muslim nation. We can move toward legalism and gain prestige, or we can move toward mysticism and lose autonomy, but gain goods produced and stuff like that. In which province is that? This one right here? It's a Coptic province that currently produces livestock. Ah, yes! These are new things that we still need to look at. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start working toward legalism. I like legalism a lot better, personally, but we'll see how that looks. Okay, this is all good. So, uh, let's take a quick look at this. You can see here we have a new button. It allows us to uh, exploit development. We would lose a development in a province in order to gain an immediate benefit. Some money, some manpower, and there are no sailors here, so that's kind of irrelevant, but that would be what we get. Uh, it's very similar to the, some of the um, raiding or um, raising mechanics, I think, that hordes have. So that's kind of interesting, and now everyone's able to do that to some extent. Obviously, you don't want to if you don't have to, but it's still kind of cool. And then lastly, new trade goods. Let's take a look. Nope, that's the wrong button. Hang on. Economic. Trade goods. Livestock has been added into the game. We also have paper. Uh, can I find an example of incense? I kind of figured there'd be some down here, but I don't see it immediately. Well, incense has been added into the game, as well as glass, which you can see up here. And the last one was gems. Gems have been added into the game as well. Where are gems? There's some gems right down here. And of course, each of them give their own special benefit once you are trading enough of them. So, some new benefits that we can have with trade goods. Kind of exciting. I was looking forward to seeing a revamp of that. Alright, let's just go ahead and declare our war against this guy. Uh, looks like his ally won't even defend him. This will be pretty interesting. Now, declaring a war on a fellow Sunni will reduce our legalism. So, we'll move toward mysticism a little bit more. Unfortunate, but that's kind of the same mechanic it's always been for the Muslim faith. Nothing really new there. The question now is, do I want to conquer this land with six development, or do I want to vassalize them so I'll be able to feed them and also take advantage of their extra troops? Hey, look, our leader already gets a defensive planner. Shock damage received reduction. Very strong in the beginning of the game. Huge fan of that. Let's go ahead. Oh, how many troops do we need? Nine? We need nine troops to siege down your fort? That's ridiculous. All right, let's go ahead and train up a couple more cavalry, I think. Uh, let's see, hey, actually, hang on. How many troops can we have cavalry here? Uh, cannot be comprised of more than 85% cavalry because we are a tribal federation. Well, that should be fine. So, yeah, I'll go ahead and train up another cavalry here, some more horse archers. And I'm going to reduce our army maintenance so that we don't go bankrupt while we are doing the siege 
but just enough that we can gradually reinforce with our manpower. And that's going to have to be good enough. So that is the beginning of the game. I know that this is just a lot of technical information for the EU4 enthusiasts. We've done practically nothing except for declare a small war. But lots of big changes in Cradle of Civilization. It's going to change the balance a lot. I'm very interested in seeing how army professionalism impacts things. And the Muslim faith, it is final, it's, it's really about time that we saw a big shift in them. You know, that's actually a new mechanic I just thought of. If we did vassalize these guys, that would give me access to the Shafa'i or whatever. We have to spend some power, but if they like us and they're my subject, we could get an extra merchant for 20 years. That's really interesting. This is going to change the geopolitics of the Muslim world a lot. Very eager to see how that turns out. But thank you all very much for watching. I do hope that you enjoyed and are looking forward to this series. If so, then be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, hit notifications, subscribe, and I will see you guys next time.